You're watching Face to Face. I'm your host, Tim Vince, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Peter Walker, author and Bible teacher. It's, it's good to be here, Tim. It's wonderful, and I, I, I know you've got quite an extensive, you know, catalogue of, of books that you've written, but we, we're going to focus on on In the Steps of Jesus. And, and just a, it would be very good uh, before we go into the details to talk about how you came to faith and what is motivating you for this series. Yeah, well, I had the joy of actually coming to faith as a very young child, but as a teenager, I heard an incredible talk about the cross of Jesus. And I went to bed that night uh, knowing I got a friend who died for me and my heart was just pumping out with, with the love, love of Jesus, if you like. Uh, then I had an opportunity to go out to the Holy Land, uh, age 20, I think it was, slightly reluctantly. I wasn't initially planning to go there, but my parents were going, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll join them. And I immediately got hooked on the place. I was already now a Christian believer, but I was going to these places where Jesus had been, and that was incredibly, um, well, <laughs> life-changing in the sense of actually seeing the, the real places. I was also uh, already convinced that we need not to overemphasize these places. You know, are they really holy places? Is Jerusalem really a holy city? And I'd read enough of the Bible to know that in some ways what the Bible is telling us is that Jesus himself is the true holy place and Jesus himself brings us everything that, that Jerusalem was. And so I knew often, that often folks say, well, in the land of the holy one. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> right. You know. Make the point, it's not the holy land, but it's the yeah. land which is pointing towards the person who is holy. Mm -hmm. And so at the back, the back of my thinking the whole time is that the person, the risen Jesus, is the fullness of what we're being given in, in God's um, wisdom. And that, that can come to any of us, wherever we are in the world, in, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, through the gospel and by the power of the Holy Spirit. But even still, it's really good to go to the physical places and to realize that this incredible truth about Jesus is anchored in real history. And that's what, what's driving me. Um, I've set up this little company, Walkway Books, and it's designed to really help people to go on these journeys, to go on physical journeys in the steps of Jesus, in the steps of St. Paul, see the Bible sites, but um, more importantly, to make sure they're also going on a spiritual journey, walking in the Jesus way, walking in the steps of Jesus, yeah. in that sense of the word. Um, so that's so, what's so the end objective, it isn't just to be an historian or archaeologist, it's actually to, to help people, I suppose, see the real personal Jesus as you personally experienced him? Well, that's right. I think Jesus is, is a real person. I think he's a real historical person mm. and he's a real alive today spiritual person. Mm. And he's one and the same. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today yeah. and forever. So when we're looking at the real historical Jesus, uh, it's good to think of him as a first century, credible Jewish teacher and make sure we've made sense of him in that kind of way. But we don't then suddenly stop and think, well, that's all he was. We've got to put the resurrection, we've got to put Easter Day in and say it's the same Jesus who was teaching, who is now risen from the dead, and we can now know him and we need to grow in our knowledge of him. Yeah. And he's beautiful, he's wonderful, he's historical, but he's also alive today and it's all one Jesus. And, and there is, uh, Peter, there's, there, there, we, we, there are places, and you've travelled all around the Holy Land, mm -hmm. um, where you can say, well, it was quite near to hear that the events happened, yeah. but we have to be careful not to make a shrine of these places. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, there was a real instinct in the days of the early church, 300 years after the time of Jesus, we must know the exact spot. Is this the tree where Zacchaeus uh, was? Uh, uh, is, this, is, the, is this the footprint where Jesus ascended to the, the Mount, uh, from the Mount of Olives? Mm. And there's, there's a natural instinct, um, but we have, I think we have override that because we can start focusing on individual places and almost begin to think, well, by being here, maybe something of that holiness mm. filters onto me, even if I'm a disobedient Christian, you know. And that's not, that's not the way of true pilgrimage and true faith. Um, and I think it's also to remember that the place ultimately is not so important as the person. Yeah. The place is important, but the more important thing is the person. So before I get sidetracked into the woman of Samaria and... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I thought you were going there. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're talking about the, uh, a, a, seri a series based on a book yeah. in, in the Steps of Jesus, yeah. w uh, where I think there are 14 you know, different programs you've produced. Well, it's 14 different chapters in the book. The book was written 20 years ago, uh, summarising my academic research. Um, but uh, beginning in Bethlehem, we go on a journey from Bethlehem and Nazareth through Galilee, Caesarea Philippi, and eventually we get up to Jerusalem and Emmaus. 
Let's yeah. slightly focus on Luke's Gospel, which gives us Bethlehem all the way to Emmaus. I love Emmaus in Luke 24, uh, but obviously it's based on all the Gospels. And uh, 14 chapters there are, are looking... It's really a, a kind of geographical biography of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, not trying to tell it in, in exactly the order in which it happened, but just saying what was Jesus doing in each of these locations, Galilee, Caesarea, Philippi, etc. Yeah. And from that, we've then done the filming, this kind of documentary video series, des- film series, designed to help people get the, the, the nuggets that are in the book, but you can put them across in a different way in live context. And of course, you can actually see um, in three dimensions the places I'm talking about in the book. So yeah. uh, the video really goes hand in glove with the book, but does add a whole extra third exactly. dimension. Exactly. So well, what we're going to do is something we've never done on Face to Face. And that is play an in- insert yes, um, yeah. a clip uh, of the Galilee. And we'll be talking more about the, you know, your, your walking in the steps of Jesus in, in the Galilee. So um, I, I'll invite you just to watch this short clip. It will help to frame what we're talking about. So when the time came for Jesus to launch his public ministry, he moved north to this region around Lake Galilee, leaving behind the Judean desert to the south and taking leave of his hometown in Nazareth, some 15 miles to the southwest. Jesus returned to Galilee, writes Luke, in the power of the Spirit. And news about him, it spread throughout the whole countryside. The people living in this region were about to experience something unique, a person 100% filled with the Spirit of God, announcing to them the arrival of the Kingdom of God that the God of Israel, their God, was about to become king, teaching them with an authority that they'd never encountered before, and backing that up with a powerful ministry of healing and exorcism, overcoming evil in all its forms. That was only a minute. Uh, I've, I've watched through the whole of the, the Galilee program, but looking at, it's, it's some great visuals mm. that was almost like virtual reality. How did you manage to achieve the well, sunny look? Everyone who sees that thinks oh, that was done against a green screen, but that was done in reality. Five o'clock on a March um, afternoon, the sun was going down. I was looking glaring into, yeah. into it. It's shining off my... Uh, I'm, I'm wearing the, the cameraman's shirt, by the way, because yeah. mine had got stuck in the Tel Aviv uh, luggage system. Um, anyway, so... Um, but it shows you just how dramatic mm. Galilee is. Mm. There we are standing on a mountain called Mount Arbel, yeah. uh, above modern Tiberias, mm. and you've got incredible views across the whole lakeside from there. Mm. And... Um, I, hopefully it's a fairly dramatic but colourful introduction to what is a sensational thing then happening in the life of Galilee, the arrival of yeah. this prophet called Jesus who's got this incredible message about a kingdom of God coming. And it, you've got to remember every Galilean is trained to fight the Romans. Yeah. Um, they, they've, because they were dominating the whole region. Dominating on <coughs> Mount Arbel. Ar- Ar- yeah. But Mount, Mount Arbel and, and that area of Magdala and the north of Galilee, there was a, a kind of thriving Jewish presence. Well, that's right. From, from Magdala, which is just below Mount Arbel, swinging around, uh, going clockwise around to Capernaum. Yeah. We've got Jewish villages all around there. They're looking over this beautiful plain of Gennesaret where Josephus, the Jew- Jewish historian, says uh, there was something in harvest every month of the year. He said it was a miracle of nature, that was his phrase. And so it's a beautiful area, but it's also a very military area. The, the Galileans, they've, um, they rose up against... Uh, uh, Herod the Great, when he died, they tried to get the Romans to, to, to out of town, and they lost lots of lives. And so when you have someone saying the kingdom of God is at hand, you can imagine they're almost getting their swords out and saying, right, this is the time for us now. We'll follow behind this leader. We'll make him king. Let's go up to Jerusalem. Let's storm the capital. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to realize that that kind of is going on behind Galilee. We can look at Galilee and think, oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't Consider it? the lilies of the valley. Yeah. But actually, it's far more sharp and tense than that. And, and you mentioned the, the Via Maris, which was yeah. the, the main highway to the sea, was right there. Right there. The, the, the main road from Damascus to the coastline and down to Egypt eventually is going right past Capernaum. Amazing. So, uh, so Jesus, if, when he chose to make his ministry HQ in Capernaum, coming down from Nazareth, which, by the way, was a little backwater, which no one ever went to, can anything good come out of Nazareth is the question that's asked of it. He comes down to Capernaum, now he's going into the centre. He's going to a place which, uh, north, east, south and west, people are going to be travelling that way um, uh, from, from Syria through to, to... Can I ask a general point? Because I've known you for 20-odd years yeah. uh, and 
um, even in that time, and I first went to uh, the, the area, I think in the late 80s, there's yeah. quite a lot of archaeological discovery since then. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite difficult to, to have a, a book or, or a video series set in time when they're, yeah. for instance, in Magdala, they find that synagogue. Well, that, that's, you know, that's quite right. recently. Uh, um, the, the latest version of the Steps of Jesus, the book, uh, was written was 15 years after the first edition. And yes, I had to change a lot to do with Magdala. Yeah. Um, because of this incredible discovery yeah. of the synagogue, uh, even with coins uh, datable to the, what the year we know as 27 um, yeah. AD or 27 CE, which is probably the first year of Jesus' public ministry. And Jesus could easily have come down that pathway underneath Mount Arbel, the first synagogue he's going to meet in Galilee, it's Magdala. And he arrives in synagogue time and starts to teach. And there's a miracle or a healing afterwards. And we hear in Matthew's Gospel about Jesus going through all, the, all their synagogues and all their towns. And so we're, we're able to see it in such a fresh mm. way now. Mm. Um, and recent archaeology has just only endorsed, it's brought it more to life, but it's also endorsed the basic historical veracity or truthfulness. And, and the, the other thing, Peter, is you sort of go off the beaten track to where we go with our coaches, because we do a trip every year, yeah. God willing. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, so you go to Chorazin, you go yeah. to Bethsaida. Well, yeah. what are the, what are the significant, what's the significance of these locations? Well, those, those two towns that you mentioned are mentioned in the Gospels, along with Capernaum, as the three places which mm. were formed a kind of gospel triangle of, of three places where Jesus did perhaps the majority of his, his teaching and his miracles. And so Jesus actually pronounces judgment on them because they didn't yeah. repent. So they need to hear that message. But to go to see those uh, hilltop towns, to go to Corridzine and see what a, a, a small village set there in the hills of Galilee might be like, to see its synagogue, um, it is again to be able to imagine uh, it as it was. If you go to Capernaum, you're slightly too more much seeing tourists and also perhaps seeing later church buildings yeah. on it yeah. and so when you can strip those away and even the later synagogue well that's yes. yeah that's right um so it's good to be able to go to back to something which is is authentically first century and one of the things we did in our videos was to try and make sure we had as little 21st century there as possible uh, no, no buses no tourists if we can help it as few church buildings as possible when you got to jerusalem it's a bit more difficult um, so, um, so we wanted to give a kind of first century illusion for the person watching these videos. They could immerse themselves and begin to imagine themselves in a first century world. They've got my voice speaking over them, trying to direct them, but hopefully the visuals are helping them to really have a 20 minute or 25 minute exposure or immersion mm. in first century Galilee. And, and the, uh, the other interesting term you pick out quite early is Jesus uh, in the Galilee of the Gentiles. Yes, yeah. The, the, you know, the, uh, folks might not think, you know, that it was so that Gentilized with the, with the Roman Empire. Then. Well, that's right. We, we've, we mentioned earlier that there were Jewish villages going around um, you know, uh, like a quadrant from, from Magdala around up to Capernaum. Mm. But much of the rest around the Lake Galilee um, was Gentile, especially in the opposite um, side of the lake, down uh, where the Gadarene swine episode takes place. Mm. And though if you've got to imagine that Galilee is actually a place of tension because there are Jewish people living there and they're, they're settlers, they're wanting to re-Judaize re this area yeah. uh, after the 10 tribes, the lost tribes of Israel who yeah. were thrown out 800 years before. And so they're ardently frontiers people wanting to build a Jewish kingdom. But unfortunately, they have to sell their fish to, to Greek Gentiles. <laughs> and they've got to speak Greek, probably if they're going to sell anything. And they've got to work out on a, on a Saturday, on Shabbat. Yeah. Shabbat. Yeah. Um, do we have any dealings with them? Now, dare I mention The Chosen? Have you seen that? Because that's seen... so dr dr dramatic. But what yeah. you provide, and I, I'm quite impressed with it, to be yeah. quite honest, but, which I didn't expect to be. Um, but what you provide is just these little nuggets of biblical insights that yeah. you, you would miss if you just watched the drama. Well, hopefully so. I suppose there's an, another angle to this. I, I'm giving um, a, a bit of a biblical theological background, mm. so, uh, which means knowing the Old Testament background, the prophecies, uh, and Old Testament references to these places, and then showing how Jesus is the one who is fulfilling that story and bringing it to a con a, a conclusion, yeah. which is what the New Testament is saying he's doing. Yeah. Matthew's Gospel is all about this happening in order to fulfill. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you can look at Jesus rather plainly and just think of a historical figure. 
But when you see him as he really is, you see him as coming on the back end of an incredible story, which has got God written all over it, and he's now coming in actually to be God uh, in the story and move it on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, we've spoken a little bit about you know locations. Um, I, I note in in the video that I watched um, that there, there I know you've got many more, but on the Galilee, you you, you point out um, the house of possibly of Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean yeah. it, it's amazing to think that that's. The, oh, I'd give that a 95% plus, you know, you really, I mean, re wow. really. The because there's evidence from about 100 AD, so just 70 years after Jesus' ministry, that a normal house, that room which has been now uh, earmarked, ha was being used for public worship. Yeah. And there are little graffiti signs um, showing that. And it's an unusual house. It's an octagon. It's, it's an octagon shaped house. Well, that's right. Well, the the inner room perhaps yeah, it's octagon. is octagon. Uh, it looks octagon. No, the inner room. Or maybe it's the church above which is octagon. Church above is octagon. Okay, technically, it. so it's a normal room okay. of the first century, which then an octagonal building has been built around got later. Um, but so it would have been one of those tiny little rooms um, of black basalt. Uh, in a, uh, a, a housing complex, which they call an island or an insula in Latin, uh, various, house, various families living together around a common courtyard. But one of them there was used for public worship in 100 AD. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and it's not the synagogue. So what is it? And it's probably a house church. Uh, and then 300 years later, when the Byzantine emperors come and the Christians can begin to do something, well, then they have an opportunity to build what we think of as a, a proper church around it. Yeah. But 95% likely to be the right place. You can't say that of many places in the Holy Land, but that, that is one of them. That's very, very interesting. Uh, so again, Jesus chose that location yeah. because of the interface with the wider world, so he could give a, mess, give a message that's beyond. It, it's a sounding parochial. board to the world. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the world is his parish, of course, yeah. in a certain sense of the word. And, uh, but, but he, so he, he preaches locally, but it's influenced globally uh, on that main road. Uh, and it's Jews and Gentiles. No, there are no Gentiles living actually in Capernaum, I don't think, but he doesn't have to go many miles before uh, he gets to Gentiles. D do you know about the feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000? Um, I know that I'm there sure are two passages. <laughs> I, know, I know a few things, but I'm here to learn. <laughs> here to no, learn. I'm sure you know everything. No, it's but good. but uh, it was fascinating for me, quite late in life, to realise you know, that the feeding of 5,000 is clearly set in Jewish territory. Yeah. Feeding the 4,000 clearly set in Gentile territory. Mm. He's on a kind of Gentile summer campaign doing his teaching, and he's got people from the southeast side of Lake Galilee, and they haven't seen the feeding of the 5,000, but he gives them a feeding of the, of the 4,000, and in Matthew and Mark's Gospel, they both give us both these miracles, and it's telling us Jesus is, is the good shepherd of Israel, but he's also searching the lost sheep of the Gentiles, yeah. if you like. Amazing. And he's, the, he's the Messiah for all people. The, the other epic, Peter, is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, the, the content, the depth of what the Lord was saying there yeah. stretches over yeah. a few chapters of Matthew. Is well, that's right. And the, the sheer authority uh, in that, Matthew chapters 5 to 7, the yeah. Sermon on the Mount, there's a Jewish scholar who said, uh, when I see what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, I want to say, who do you think you are? God? Yes. Because it's a sheer authority. You've heard it said to you, but now I say to you. And of course, for Matthew, he's going up on a mountain. It's not a peaked mountain. It may just be a hillside, but it's evoking the whole idea of Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Moses received the revelation from God, and Jesus is giving us a new Torah, a new law, leading to a new form of discipleship, radical. Um, and uh, it's just the sheer power. And at the end of the sermon, if you don't do what I say, your house will be built on sand. I mean, did you ever hear a preacher say that yeah. to you? And uh, yeah. it's a the authority, and yet we read it and don't think of it as and amazing. It is noticeable, the three towns or villages yeah. that he said woe to yeah. are now, as it were, yeah. in a woeful state. They are in a woeful state, that's right. And that was commented on by Christians a few hundred years after the time of Jesus. They could see, well, again, a word of prophecy that came true, uh, just as he predicted about the temple, by the way, when we get to Jerusalem. But so he had predicted that over those villages as well. So it was evidence of the true prophetic power mm. of this Jesus. I'm going to have a crack at one more, and that is the, the choosing of the disciples was yeah. all up in that area, wasn't it? Yeah, that's Largely. Right. Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean, uh, probably actually he prays on the Golan Heights on the eastern side, I think. Okay. Uh, he has a night of prayer on that. Um, 
It's again another mountain, and Matthew loves the idea of mountains, Sermon on the Mount, we're going to have the Mountain of Transfiguration later. And Jesus eventually is going to stand on a mountain in Galilee and give them the Great Commission. So yeah. Matthew's got this incredible mountain theme running, and one of those is the night he goes up to pray for, for the disciples yeah. to choose the um, uh, you, you mention, e even in our clip, it's a place of miracles and, and exorcism. Yeah. Um, in the modern world, they, that's, there's a struggle yeah. to accept that. Is there, is there any um, a one incident that we, that we can focus on to appeal to the sceptics in terms of this happened and we, you know, in this location and the significance of it? Uh, I don't know if there's one location no. which, which really um, can... Yeah. Or, gen the, uh, yeah, or one event yeah. 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 in that area. Well, <laughs> it's difficult because in the modern world, yeah. people just, there, there's such, such a sceptical yeah. world yeah. That we live in. I, th I mean, you could, sort of, could even use one of the, sort of the, the miracles of um, Jesus just healing on a Sabbath day, which mm. uh, to us doesn't sound particularly, but given, it sounds particularly important, but given the controversy that Jesus excited by doing that, such that people after he did that said, we're going to kill him, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, yeah. they were angry with him and how they're going to get rid of him. Um, again, that's not the kind of story you invent, really, and it's not the kind of ministry you do if you're just wanting to get the reputation of being someone who's got a bit of mir miraculous power. It's clearly something which they find deeply offensive, which Jesus does and is happy to provoke the reaction he gets. And so it just seems historically credible mm. that he goes into that situation with the power to do it and the power to provoke, yeah. and he causes the reaction, and they end up putting him on a cross. Yes. So I think you look at it from that point of view. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't... And the other one is you, uh, the, when he says, your sins are forgiven. Oh, you, yeah. know, that you wouldn't have thought that would be the first thing yeah. Yeah. That, that, some, that a human being would say. Sure, no, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I think, and that just shows the, um, the authority of Jesus as a saviour. I mean, by the way, when he says that, Basically, you're meant to go to the temple to get your forgiveness. Yes. Like you're meant to go to Swansea to get your driving license. Yeah. Uh, he says, you don't have to go to Swansea. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Just come to me. Yeah. And they sit around and think, shock, horror. And then he, he does the almost easy thing of just causing the paralytic to, to get up, yeah. <laughs> up off the floor. But he's done the far more difficult thing. The greater miracle is that there's someone here who can forgive you uh, and me, my sins against Almighty God. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, really wonderful. So wait, you were in the last five minutes. Yeah. Um, let's steer it back to where you started in terms yeah. of um, reaching people in today's world yeah. and drawing them into the story. Yeah. Just, just talk us through well, I think, the objectives. Um, I, I think that it's very easy to have a very churchy view of Jesus. And we have been involved in the church for a long time and end up with a slightly stained glass yeah. window effect on Jesus. And the halo goes on and the white Victorian robe. Um, and, and then that actually doesn't satisfy us as believers, by the way, mm. and it doesn't satisfy the person outside who wants to look uh, with some realism and historical uh, attitude to things. Mm. And therefore I hope that th this video series uh, is actually taking away some of the later Christian veneer over mm. Jesus and allowing him to emerge as a credible historical character, mm. someone who one can believe in. I often think that my work on Jesus has helped me to understand how gutsy he was, how, mm. how provocative he was, how brave he was. Mm. I mean, it's one thing to believe that you're going to be raised from the dead, but there's another thing to actually go and let yourself be crucified. Yes. You think how gutsy you have to be to do that. Yeah. Uh, sheer faith and sheer See, growth. I would think yeah. a gutsy to walk on the water. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Especially someone who I nearly drowned once. Uh, mind you, Peter had. Oh, did you try it? Uh, but, uh, age five, I, I tried to walk on water without success. Um, um, but, but Peter, the, again, was yeah. gutsy. You yeah. know, the characters are real characters. It, uh, it doesn't well, seem like it's a made up story. No, that's right. And so I think what we were trying to do in, in this was to. Uh, take the, the, the churchy side off Jesus mm. um, and also to really help people to get their imagination going uh, in the best sense of the word not imaginary um, fantasy world but to get see the real history see the real geography hear about the historical events and imagine these events historically mm. And I think sometimes cr biblical critics and people are skeptical they're not using their imagination actually if you, like when you read a historical no novel, you get inside it and you say, oh, this all makes sense. Well, we ought to use the same kind of imagination in, in, as we read the Gospels and really think of them and get ourselves inside them. 
Uh, and that's what I hope this video series does. And it's not just short clips. No. We deliberately have kept a 20, 25 minute immersive experience to enable people to go that deeper level. Not just get a bit of information, That's right. but to live into it, to inhabit a first century world. And out of that, you suddenly find this Jesus just makes sense. I mean, what's the problem? Uh, almost. It well, it does to me. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> As Obama once said. Um, uh, the other thing you bring out is the prophecies concerning Jesus. Yeah. And they are remarkable, aren't they? Yeah. They're miraculous in, yeah. in their own rights. Yeah. You know, the yeah. prophecies of his coming and yeah. what he did. He, it, couldn't, it couldn't easily have been concocted to no. fit in with prophecies. Well, that, that, that's right. And um, some people look at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel and they see some of the, the things which Matthew says are being predicted. Actually, um, you're just seeing the power of the way in which Jesus does walk into the biblical story and gives a fulfillment, but it's still always a surprising fulfillment. It's always slightly, mm. slightly more uh, than even what the prophecy was going for, in a sense. That's right. So it's not as though the, 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 the gospel event has been created in order to fit. Mm. Jesus comes and does something and they look and says, well, that is actually an even bigger fulfillment of, of this. Yes. Uh, and so... Uh, it's and then the other thing that you couldn't script, as it were, is the reaction. So, so that he, he's saying things which are offensive to the prevalent sort of Jewish culture of the day and claiming to be the Messiah was massive well, that's and offensive. Right. Well, that's right. And Jesus is provocative. Um, and again, that brings out the, the gutsy side of him in, mm. in a sense. But he's not frightened to challenge. And a lot of the time he's actually agreeing with people about how it is they're meant to sort of follow God, but he's saying, this is a new day. Uh, I am a new person. The kingdom of God is now coming in a new way. It's coming through me. And this is a new, a new age. And things are going to be different once I've been raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. So he, he's pushing hard to say, you've got to realize that I am now the center of the story and the whole of the, the new community is going to be gathered around me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really powerful. And you, then, was he proud? Or was he just speaking the truth? It's a big question, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, but was he deceitful, you yeah. know, in his claims? It doesn't seem to square with yeah. what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, a remarkable story. We're in the last few minutes, but go on, final comments. I was going to say truth, holiness, and love. That's what I see in yes. Jesus. Truth, yeah. holiness, and love. No mm. deceit, no sin, and no malice or hatred. Mm. And you and I, we, we don't get those things, and we yeah. can't put them all together but he does. So I deeply believe in this Jesus, history and risen from the dead. Bless you, uh, Peter. In the steps of Jesus in the Galilee. Thank you so much for your time. It's been good to be here. And thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time on Face to Face.